Okay, thank you very much. And now to get to our lunchtime speaker. Uh, so it's both a privilege and an honor to introduce a woman who has been such an inspirational role model for me, Indira Samara Sekra. I first met Indira when I was a young engineer working at Stelco. I just graduated from McGill and was starting my career in the steel industry. At the time, Indira was a professor at UBC and her research work involved developing mathematical models of industrial processes. During her visit, she presented and discussed the relevance of her research to the steel industry. Her enthusiasm and passion for her research she did was infectious and was one of the reasons I decided to return to university and pursue a PhD in metals and materials engineering under her supervision. The qualities that have been constant in my interaction with Indira have been her unwavering enthusiasm for her work, her fairness in dealing with people, and the extremely high standards she sets for herself and those around her, especially her graduate students. Throughout my career, Indira has always been a wonderful role model for me, especially the way she has managed to balance an extremely successful academic career with her family life as a mother. As I started my own academic career, Indira moved into senior administration, becoming the VP research at UBC and then the president at the University of Alberta. Throughout these experiences, I continued to learn from her in terms of what it meant to be a leader and how to communicate a vision that resonated with people and excited them. Not an easy task in academia, I might add. I am very pleased to welcome Indira Samar Sekura. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, it's really such a joy to be here. And let me uh, begin by saying I'm so proud of Mary uh, and other graduate students. Colleen Legsons is here, is also a former graduate student. Mary, I want to congratulate you on becoming president of MedSoc. What a great thing that you've done. <laughs> and you. When Mary asked me to speak at this event, how could I refuse? Uh, it was such a great opportunity to see so many friends after being uh, sadly too busy almost for 10 years to attend a conference of melodists. Um, so I decided I'd talk a little bit about leadership. And um, as you heard, the title of my presentation was Glass Ceiling to Magic Carpet, Leading Change, because I, I really want to talk about uh, new ways of thinking about leadership. Let's leave the old paradigms behind. Thinking about leadership, I recall my, almost have been the first week on the job at the University of Alberta, where I was uh, traveling around in a golf cart, handing out little goodies to students, and just generally getting to know people. And um, one of the, before I could hand out a goodie, I would ask a question of the students. So one student, I said, when was the University of Alberta founded? I asked this one very bright-eyed student. Without a blink, 1779, he responded. <laughs> I suggested he might want to try a history course. <laughs> Another student approached me. I asked her, do you know who the first president of the University of Alberta was? No, she responded, and who are you? I said, who do you think I am? She looked at me for a few seconds. Her face brightened, and she said, you must be the student union president. <laughs> as flattered as I was to be mistaken for a 20-year-old, I learned something critical that day. Leadership does not stamp you with any distinguishing, recognizable mark. Instead, I realized that leadership is something you earn and create over time. Having opportunity is one thing, but it's how you bring together the various threads of the job and the organization, how you weave your own best qualities and color it all with learning that adds up to something extraordinary, sometimes even a little bit magical. So let me begin with some stories. I just I think stories are the best way uh, uh, that we learn. This is a story about a young woman who arrived in the United States with little money and no safety net. She was a South Indian girl from Chennai with an undergraduate education in physics, chemistry, and mathematics. She worked as a receptionist from midnight to early morning to help pay for her master's degree. 
in public and private management from Yale University. She struggled to save $50 to buy a Western suit for her first job interview. But at the last minute, uh, she had cold feet wearing a suit, so she thought she'd just wear trousers instead. And they only went up to her ankles. She didn't get the job, so she sought advice from her professor as to what to wear for the next interview. He asked her what she would wear in India. She replied that it would be a sari, and he said, be yourself. She wore a sari for the next interview, and she got the job. I'm speaking of Indra Nui, CEO of PepsiCo. Forbes lists her as the second most powerful businesswoman in the world, second to Ginny Rometty of IBM. If an Asian woman who came to this uh, continent with no American network, no support system, could rise to become CEO of public company, one wonders whether the metaphor of glass ceiling really adequately describes our world today. There's no question that barriers remain for women attempting to pursue their dreams. As mentioned earlier, there's too few women who have reached the top echelons of the global corporate ladder. Women hold only 4.6% of Fortune 500 companies. There's only 19 female presidents and prime ministers in power around the globe. And yet, we know that the numbers of women running the largest and most successful organizations in the world, whether they be companies or nonprofits, are rising and they are doing so successfully. So I believe we should replace the metaphor of glass ceiling. I would like to replace it with another that captures the possibilities of leadership for us. There can be something, although there's something brave and courageous about a woman breaking the glass ceiling, overcoming barriers and going beyond limits, the metaphor speaks to me mostly of pain. Have you tried to run full tilt into a window or a glass door, unaware of its existence? It hurts. And if you break through, what happens? Cuts, pain, permanent scars. So the metaphor of glass ceiling suggests that the pursuit of leadership for a woman is a losing proposition. Either you are bent over double with frustration, unable to penetrate the glass ceiling, or you are deeply scarred by the effort of breaking through. Now, I've encountered barriers along the way. During my research career working with several steel companies, I can tell you it wasn't easy to walk into a room full of men, uh, whether it was in the lab or a factory floor, uh, and command their attention. I came from a culture where women do not speak up. I had to learn how to be heard especially in male-dominated spaces. But overall, I would not characterize my journey to leadership as a series of events that only involved confronting and overcoming barriers. Instead, I would characterize my journey in a much different way. I would say, instead, I've been offered a series of opportunities, many of them extremely challenging. And in each case, I have learned by trial and error, perhaps, to weave together the existing skills, qualities, and experiences, and add in new ones. And through inspiration and aspiration, I have found that the results always is something more than I expected. It's a kind of magical alchemy that in some ways is inexplicable, and yet when you experience it, it is powerful. You discover that you have the power to transport yourself and others indeed the whole organization to a new place. So today I'd like to offer, as I said, a different metaphor. One that lies closer to home for me. It begins, again, with a story. In the ancient Arabian tale called 1001 Nights, there is a sultan who is so bitter with the betrayal of his first wife that he vows to marry a new woman each day and kill her at dawn the next day. In spite of this, one woman, Shahrazad, agrees to marry him, and each night begins to tell a story that is so captivating and suspenseful that the sultan puts off her execution day after day. Eventually, he is so beguiled by her narrative powers that he revokes his decree and calls her the liberator of the sex. 
One of the most enduring metaphors from Shaharad's tales is that of the magic flying carpet. It is a device she bestows upon her character, Prince Hussein, who is able to transport himself by hopping onto the carpet and willing it to move. The carpet for me is a wonderful image. It's a practical thing, very domestic, and yet an object of beauty and art. Carpets every now are very, even now are often produced by females. The pattern woven into the carpet tells a story, contains symbolic meanings. Carpets ground you, but they transport you at the same time if they are magic. When I consider the course of my life, I've been offered opportunities that have allowed me metaphorically to weave a magic carpet, and I've been able to use to take me to places I wish to go. When I finished my PhD in metallurgical engineering, I was raising two children as a single parent while trying to build my academic career. My department chair, Fred Weinberg, put it succinctly when he told me what I needed to do. Produce a miracle or two a week, he said. You must aim to build an international reputation within five years, and within 10 years, tend to be an internationally recognized leader. Otherwise, you're toast. Kid, let's call me kid. A tall order, but very clear goals. I was fortunate to have had done my PhD under the supervision of Dr. Keith Bremacom. Many in the room know him, an unbelievably visionary leader in the fields of metallurgical engineering. Keith was an extraordinary role model. When I first arrived at UBC and met him to inquire what I might do for my PhD, he pulled out a paper napkin from his desk drawer and proceeded to share with me a discussion he had had with a steel plant operator in a bar. This discussion was the basis of the idea for my PhD thesis. Keith explored outside the margins. He taught me first and foremost to be bold, to be daring, and to never, ever compromise the pursuit of excellence. So as a young academic, I toiled away hard, pursuing excellence, trying to gain this elusive international reputation that I so desired. After a few years of tiling away, I submitted a three-part paper to the most prestigious metallurgical engineering journal of the day, METRANS. It was rejected. I was crushed. Tenure and promotion were on the line. I thought I'd had the magic carpet, but clearly it wasn't taking me anywhere at all. So I went back to Fred Weinberg, the department head, and said, what do I do now? He said, put away the papers and don't look at them for two weeks. Then sit down with a clear eye and write a letter showing why your papers should be published and what improvements you would make to address the reviewer's concerns. Very tough task. I had to combine my own biased perspectives of my work with the critical comments of the reviewer to compose an effective rebuttal. I had to figure out how to make the carpet fly again and take me to the next stage of my career. It worked. The papers were published and years later became the basis of a very successful million dollar research program of the American Institute of Iron and Steel. Through those years, I was quite content going up the traditional academic ladder progressing from assistant professor to professor, expanding my international reputation. I deliberately chose not to become a department chair or dean, because as a single parent, I wanted the flexibility and I that I enjoyed as an academic. How then did I end up becoming president of the University of Alberta? It might have never happened if my colleagues hadn't pushed me onto a new carpet. When UBC was looking for a vice president research, they nominated me for the position, in spite of the fact that I had no administrative experience. Initially, I was reluctant, but my instincts told me to take up the challenge, and so I applied. At my interview, President Martha Piper cut right to the chase and asked me why I thought I could do the job without any administrative experience. It was a critical moment and I had, had to begin weaving the story quickly. As I spoke, I began to realize that I had had experiences and skills that I hadn't really considered before. I knew what researchers needed. 
I had led many uh, organizations uh, in a volunteer capacity, provided leadership, and in particular, I had been the president of MedSoc uh, in 1995. I had ideas of how UBC could support researchers more effectively. I could see where we needed to go, and I convinced myself, and fortunately Martha Piper and the other members of the search committee, that I could get us there. I'll never forget my first day on the job as uh, Vice President Research. I walk into my office and there's an envelope from the President's office and I'm kind of quite chuffed and I'm thinking there's some important instructions about my job. I open it and there was a magic wand, a Harry Potter wand with a little note from Martha. Dear Indira, welcome to the team, make magic now. My time as VP Research at UBC turned out to be one of the most energizing moves I'd ever made. It took time, of course, for my vision to take flight and to move things, but I learned that it was possible, that I could rally my skills, put together a talented team, and drive the organization forward. So when the University of Alberta expressed interest in my candidacy for president, I knew another opportunity had just been laid at my feet. I can tell you that weaving a magic carpet large enough and strong enough to move a complex academic institution has indeed tested all of my skills as a leader. I like to say universities, in universities, unlike corporations, everybody is the boss and nobody is the boss. So I have had to grow in ways I couldn't have imagined. I'll readily admit that there are parts of the carpet where the threads were dropped, places where it was wearing thin. A leader who doesn't fail isn't one who takes risks, uh, is, is, is also one who doesn't take risks. A leader who doesn't fail is also one who doesn't take risks. At the same time, I feel so privileged to have had the opportunity to lead an institution that espouses the values that I treasure most. Uh, and that has consistently underpinned my own journey as a leader. The, the, value, the, the value that, for me, has been central to my career is excellence. My father admired outstanding human achievement and throughout my childhood would often discuss who had won Nobel Prizes in medicine or physics or Olympic gold medals. Living on a small island of Sri Lanka, Nobel Prizes and Olympic medals seemed like a pipe dream. We would chuckle every time he talked about this. However, these conversations inculcated me in me a spirit of adventure, of achievement, and of excellence. When I look back, I see that this has formed the warp and the weave of my particular leadership carpet and has given me the will to move it. Why is excellence so important for leadership? It's best captured for me in this quotation. Excellence can be attained if you care more than others think is wise. Risk more than others think is safe. Dream more than others think is practical. And expect more than others think is possible. Without these characteristics, you cannot inspire others to make a difference. I think of one of the youngest women to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Tawakal Karman, who had the, I had the opportunity to meet at the University of Alberta when we gave her an honorary degree. She came from a country where most women are shrouded from head to foot. She risked everything to publicly lead the fight for democracy in Yemen, for a free press, for better health care and education for women. There's no doubt that she risked more than others thought it safe. I think too of Mother Teresa, cared for the poorest of poor in the slums of Calcutta, winning a Nobel Peace Prize for her humanitarian efforts. She cared more than others thought it wise. Wilma Rudolph, the African-American athlete and civil rights activist who was born severely premature, contracted infantile paralysis, polio, and wore a brace until she was nine. She won three gold medals in track and field in the 1960 Olympic Games in Rome. She dreamed more than others thought it practical. Margaret Thatcher, dubbed the Iron Lady, transformed Britain into a modern competitive economic powerhouse restored its stature as a leading nation. She expected more than others thought it possible. So I am convinced that if you strive for excellence in all that you do, you create conditions where those 
you lead can also strive for excellence. There is no glass ceiling. There may be indeed times of frustration and pain, but the overriding motivating forces are inspiration, aspiration, opportunity, and excellence. Let me close with one more story about opportunity, because that, I think, is the door that opens that leads you towards excellence. So this is my last uh, story and concluding remarks. There was a devout farmer in Tennessee who lived on a floodplain. Every year his farm would flood and life was always difficult because he never knew how bad the flood was going to be. One year the floods were very bad. Neighborhoods near where the farmer lived were being evacuated. The farmer's house was beginning to flood and water was coming up to the steps of his porch. The farmer was up to his ankles in water. A rescue boat came by uh, and suggested that he get in uh, because it would be best uh, because the waters were rising fast. The farmer said, no, I'm going to stay. Lord will save me. Eight hours later, another boat came by and the farmer was on the roof because the waters had ris risen so high. And the rescue boat insisted that the farmer must leave. The farmer stubbornly refused and said, I know the Lord will save me. The crew said okay and said another rescue operation will be by shortly. Sure enough, two hours later, the water was rising fast and the farmer was hanging on for dear life on, on his roof. A helicopter hovered over with the speaker and said, come on up now, you are going to drown. He said, no, I have complete faith in the Lord, he will rescue me. The farmer, of course, dies and go to heaven and he meets the Lord and says, Lord, I trusted you completely. Why didn't you save me? The Lord said, you jackass, I sent you two boats and a helicopter. What more did you want? <laughs> so, opportunity. Opportunity is absolutely crucial in terms of your ability to recognize which door will lead you so you can then get on your magic carpet and fly. And excellence, absolutely pursuing excellence, uh, will never, never uh, uh, shortchange your dreams. So thank you very much. And Indira said she's uh, happy to answer some questions if there's anybody from the audience that would like to ask her something. Go ahead. Hello. Um, again, I'll second the thank you. Very inspirational, and I can see why I overheard somebody talking about you in the hallway. And they say she's an amazing speaker. You've got to stay and listen to her, and you really are. So thank you for that. Um, I want to ask you a question about um, who do who, like along your. Who would you say was your biggest mentor? Like, oh, somebody who pushed you along the most? If you consider that somebody was out, like, did you have a champion who helped you with your career path? I had many champions, but you know, my PhD supervisor, Keith Bremacombe, certainly was one of them. Yep. And, but I mentioned Fred Weinberg, who was the department chair. And uh, Alex McLean sitting in this room, a uh, former friend and colleague, a current friend and former colleague, who was my uh, supervisor of um, review of my PhD thesis. The thing about mentors like Keith was that he would enlist all of his other friends, like Alex, to be your mentors too. Mm -hmm. And so I inherited a network of colleagues who were uh, extremely supportive. I have to say I was also very fortunate uh, that my parents were incredibly, my father was an uh, amazing inspiration as was my mother uh, in terms of pursuing engineering and, uh, and taking on uh, challenges. And the, the message of excellence came from there. So. Yeah. I think one little comment I want to put is like just my reflections of the day. It's been really fascinating how much mentorship seems to play a big role in a lot of success stories or, or champions. So just a personal message for me to others is uh, I think we should all try and be mentors because it sounds like that's the resounding theme that we're hearing about the special champion, especially our male colleagues who step up and are the people who help push you along and grow your confidence. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for that, for that comment. One of the books I read recently is, was also about mentorship alone is not enough. You use the word champion. You need people to champion, uh, champion you. When I was uh, uh, a professor at UBC, two colleagues, Ray Metacraft and Martha Salkudian, uh, who were both professors in materials engineering, 
championed my nomination for vice president of research, something I really didn't want to do. And you need those kinds of people too who are willing to put out the effort to ensure uh, you uh, they help you advance to the next. So it's mentorship, but also champions. Thank you, Mary, for the opportunity to make a comment. Thank you, Indira, for a most inspiring address. It applies both to men and women. Now, folks, just for your information, I remember when Keith sent me Indira's doctoral thesis, and I read through it, of course, and made some comments, and in a letter back to Keith, I remember writing, this is an amazing young lady. She's going to do well. <laughs> but never did I think she would do as well as she has done. Congratulations, Indira, on all that you have done, both within academia, working with industry, with government agencies and committees, with business, and with professional associations. Thank you for the great example that you are to all of us. Keith would have been delighted to see what you have achieved. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Alex. Much. And thank, thank you. you for your friendship and support. Thank it's you very mutual. much. Thank you. Yeah. You'll find that colleagues serve an important purpose. I see my friend sitting over there, Carolyn Hansen. I'll never forget, she and I were playing tennis at a TMS meeting where I was talking to her about this VP research position, and she said, you must do it. And so, you know, having colleagues who believe in you and support you are just as important. So, Carolyn, another person who helped me go on that path. Well, I think this ends the sort of formal part of it. Um, I just wanted to mention part of what we wanted to do in the symposia was to profile and hear the stories of women that have made an impact in the metals, uh, materials, and mining field. And we do have a book that you can get at the, the back of the room when you're finished. So please feel free to take a copy. If you want to get it autographed by some of the women who are here and profiled, go ahead. So, um, but many of the women that are profiled, in, uh, the 18 women that are profiled in the book are in this room today. So it's a really great pleasure. And just uh, join me again uh, in thanking Indira for such an inspirational talk. <laughs>